Good afternoon. It is 3.04, Wednesday, February 26th. This is the TDN Writer's Room Podcast presented by Keeneland. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm the Associate Editor at the Thoroughbred Daily News. Hair flowing beautifully as usual. I'm Bill Finley, and sadly, I have no title. Jonathan Green, General Manager of DJ Stable. And I was so enamored with AP Indy that I actually named my first dog after him. Wow. AP or Indy? Indy. Okay. Indy. <laughs> Just like Good. we named the dog Indiana. Uh, Alan Carrasso, managing editor of the TDN, and I, I hate driving with the car window open because my hair blows all over the damn place. <laughs> Even when you're blasting Buck Cherry? Absolutely. <laughs> Bill's intro gets sadder every week. We've got to give him an actual title. All right, so this week, uh, we've got some good racing coming up this weekend uh, across the globe, really. We have the Saudi Cup, the first running of the Saudi Cup, and we have the Fountain of Youth as well. As John said, the big boy races start for the three-year-olds now. Uh, we'll start with the Saudi Cup just because the purse is so enormous, $20 million. We're glad to have our resident Euro slash foreign racing expert, Al, here to illuminate us on some of the horses. It's a 12, it's a 14 horse field, excuse me. Um, it's an interesting thing because I don't remember this happening. Maybe it's happened before my time, but the fact that it's a new race, such a giant purse, new racetrack, nobody really knows anything about this place. It's interesting. It's a little, it's a little artificial, honestly, if you, if you ask me. But I think it, it, because it has such a big purse, it drew such a strong field. And I should mention our uh, editor-in-chief, Jessica Martini, is on the ground. She's on the ground yet. I think she's still in the air. But she will be uh, at the Saudi Cup this week providing coverage. So interestingly enough, the four main U.S. chances all drew right next door to each other. You have Midnight Bizu in the six hole. Maximum Security was the two to one favorite in the seven hole. Mucho Gusto eight and McKinsey nine. Uh, there's also Tacitus, who's a bit of a long shot in the two post. The shortest price on the morning line, at least of all the Euro slash foreign chances, is Ben Battle the, and, and the three post at 11 to two. Uh, I believe he's been mostly a turf horse uh, throughout his career, but has won on the dirt fairly recently. I think we should start with Al. Al, how would you handicap this race? Very carefully. How about that? <laughs> I mean, obviously, the race goes through um, the American horses. You know, John and I were just talking off the air. It's an interesting configuration. It's a one-turn, 1,800-meter race. So, uh, you know, nine furlongs with a long run to the first turn, a sweeping Belmont-like far turn, and then a long run in. So I think that um, the emphasis is on stamina. So it's nine furlongs. Maximum security obviously stays nine furlongs. You wonder about a horse like Midnight Bizu. They seem to have been hesitant to run her over further than nine furlongs. She's obviously stayed nine furlongs so okay. But I'll be curious to see how she, how she gets on. You know, it's an interesting interesting race. And also, I should mention Magic Wand, who is one of your favorites, who it seems runs every week in a different country, every week. She's 25 to 1 on the morning line and is in the 12 post. She adds a little more flavor to the race as well. It's cool because it's like, I think the nice thing about it is this seems kind of like a Breeders' Cup dream matchup that we really didn't get in the Breeders' Cup other than McKinsey because Maximum Security wasn't there. Midnight Bizu ran in the Distaff. Uh, Mucho Gusto, was he in the Breeders' Cup Classic? No, right? Yeah, he's, no, he he's, was not. He, yeah, no. he, was, he was off the layoff in the Pegasus. So it's, it's honestly, I think it's kind of an upgraded version of the Classic. Uh, Bill, John, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I know nothing of the foreign horses whatsoever. So you're talking about nine out of 14 horses. You know, it's just complete guesswork. And Alan, of course, is the, the real expert on that. But I think if you box the five American horses in the Superfecta, you almost have to win. You know, these are good dirt horses that race at the very top level. And the other horses come in from Japan, this or that, uh, Europe. Again, uh, I mean, they're just not what we have here when they get to the dirt. Uh, you know, the Colmore horse is a horse that uh, has run well all over the world but never seems to win. She's been on the turf throughout her career. So, you know, I, I mean, that's not stepping out on a limb or anything, but I think the Americans will absolutely dominate this race. Uh, you know, Ben Battle ran very, very well last time they they – Debuted him on the on the dirt and the mocked him challenge over a mile and three sixteenths, and I, I I've seen some people knocking him for the the trip that he sat. I mean he was three wide the trip going uh, maybe a little further than he prefers, but when you know when Sumion asked him to go he he really went, and for first time on dirt with potential for more, and for better I thought it was very good effort, so. Um, you know, he's gotten the green light from Sheikh Mohammed to, to take this 
uh, chance, and you know, I think it's all systems go for, for him. Don't sell short the Japanese horse, Crystal Burl. He's undefeated in six, uh, six starts, including a, a, a Group 1, um, where he beat Gold Dream, who's also in, in the race. I think he's a very good horse. They have Breeders' Cup Classic um, aspirations for him as well. I knew you'd have an angle on a Japanese horse or a Korean horse. You knew it. Um, the, one of the interesting things about this, I think, beyond this race, is how it affects the rest of the calendar. And especially with the Dubai World Cup being in a little bit over a month's time, it's going to be interesting to see which horses are able to run in both races, which horses choose to run in both races, and whether or not if they do – that knocks them out for a longer time. Because I we always t talked in the past about the Dubai bounce and horses taking a lot of time sometimes to really come back off of that trip. And Arrogate is one I would point to specifically. Now, he's a little different because all three of his races when he came back were at Del Mar. Maybe he just hated Del Mar. But he ran one of the most incredible races, honestly, I think I've ever seen in the Dubai World Cup and then came back and was okay in the Pacific Classic but not good in the other two races. And we've seen that before. We've seen other horses struggle to maintain their form when they come back. Now you got two starts across the world, potentially. And I wonder if, and I don't know, it's going to be interesting to see how those horses come back. Uh, and yeah, whether or not they contest both and then whether or not they're still the same horse when they come back. Well, Joe, it's already cost the Pegasus. We know that. Right. Uh, I mean, the, the whole thing that why they had to wind up with a $3 million purse, I think had a lot to do with the Saudi Cup because people weren't going to run under the old format where they had to put up all that money. I mean, uh, even like Midnight Bisu, they said, you know, moments after they announced that she was going to come back as, as uh, an older horse this year, uh, was she five now, um, that she was going to run in the Saudi Cup. They didn't even give any consideration to the, the, the Pegasus at all. So, you know, it's a nice, it's, you know, it's better than a nice race. It's a really, you know, huge race with a great field. But if you just want to look at a perspective of American racing, it's not good for American racing. And you have, of course, the Pegasus World Cup. Already the big cap is not anywhere near what it used to be, mostly because of the Dubai World Cup. This is going to be another uh, problem for them either. So, uh, you know, it's almost like if you want to get the very best American handicap horses on the dirt, you almost can't even get started now to like maybe Saratoga. Or yeah, something. no, I was just going to say that, that, uh, I mean, Stephen, Stephen Foster too, used to be a big deal. And now it's a grade two and has, has dropped severely, I think in importance. So yeah, what's the, what's the first big American dirt race after the Pegasus, probably the Whitney, right? I, I couldn't think of another the one. The only other one, and it kind of doesn't fall neatly into the category, perhaps the Met Mile. Yeah, okay. But uh, you're right about that. I, I think that, uh, you know, the horses that run uh, in the Saudi Cup, and if they run well, I don't see why they wouldn't go to Dubai. Uh, I mean, that's like shipping from, like, Pimlico to, uh, you know, Monmouth or something right. like that. I mean, it, 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 I believe I looked it up one time. It's like 450 miles. So it, it's not that much of an impediment whatsoever. You're already over there. There's the, all that money sitting out there. So I think that's what we're going to see, that it's going to be – people are going to go over for these two races. Uh, and, again, not good for American racing. You're right. Uh, Joe, you probably nailed it on the head. You know, whoever wins this race uh, – Probably we won't see him in the United States, maybe till the Whitney. And maybe, maybe ever again, honestly, like because if you if you somehow win both of these races and you have that as a stallion prospect, what I mean, what are you? Unless you really, really, really care about the Horse of the Year trophy in America, what are you really coming back for? Do you really want to risk trying to restart a horse's campaign just to maybe end up in the Breeders' Cup Classic and win like a third of the money that you've already won? One thing I would add uh, is that I think they will race again, even if somebody hits the daily double with all that money over there. And I, I think the, the reason is the Breeders' Cup is still a huge draw for American racing interest. <laughs> you know, now in this day and age, you look at its purse and say, ho-hum, you know, it's not that big a deal. But, you know, much like the Kentucky Derby, everybody wants to run a horse in the Kentucky Derby. It, maybe not to the same extent with the Breeders' Cup, but almost the same extent. You know, once you get uh, into Saratoga, Del Mar, that sort of thing, you know, everybody wants to be in the classic. So, you know, I hope you're, I just hope you're wrong about that because, again, you know, if we lose these horses and they, they make two starts overseas and then we don't see them again, you know, geez, what, what the heck is that doing for American racing? Absolutely nothing. But I, I think they will come back for the Breeders' Cup. But you might see uh, Saudi Arabia, Dubai, one prep Breeders' Cup Classic, something yeah, like that. Right. It's, it's going to severely impact their American schedule, I think, no matter what. And it's how do you feel if you're the Stronics right now? you got to feel like paupers compared to the to the Saudis that they can just throw $20 million, create an entirely new racetrack, and then get the best horses in the world. Meanwhile, the Pegasus is, is 
now what one fifth of the purse that it was when it first started and even then they had to get the owners to kick in all that money just to run it so yeah it's it's i don't know i said it's a little artificial before it just seems like people who have that much money they're kind of buying the prestige of American dirt racing, and we are we don't really get to see these horses now that much this year. And if I remember correctly, this isn't because it's a, the inaugural race. It's not a graded race. Right. So imagine next year when, you know, grading comes out and they end up earning a grade two or a grade one. Um, then it will be a draw for horses that, that want to become stallions. I think more even so from, from the European racing um, as well as the American racing. For sure. And one other thing, that this is the first time they'll run a turf race in Saudi Arabia on, on Saturday, um, they, they put in a turf course just a little over six months ago. So it'll be interesting to see how it rides and how it's, how it's taken. And it's always a bit jarring to the system to see this patch of desert with this lush green. It's an oasis. Oval, it's an know? oasis is what it is. It's not real. But And then they've got some some really nice horses. Deirdre from Japan and uh, Melbourne Cup winner cross, uh, cross counter, uh, Prince of Aaron's Globetrotter. So... They got some uh, some nice horses to, to take it for a spin the first time. The TDN Writers Room is sponsored by Keeneland, the home of world-class racing and industry-leading sales. Keeneland's next auction is the April two-year-olds in training and horses of racing age sale on Tuesday, April 7th. Nomination deadline for horses of racing age is this coming Monday, March 2nd. So Keeneland had a, uh, an international flavor in terms of success of their graduates uh, this past weekend. And the big one was Keeneland September grad Mozu Ascot, who won the February Stakes Group 1 in Japan, which is a win and you're in for the Breeders' Cup Classic, which will be at Keeneland this fall. I'm going to bring in Al again and tell me your thoughts on Mozu Ascot. I mean, I, he won the, the Yasudakin in uh, two years ago, which is one of the two premier mile races on the grass in Japan. And he's by Frankel. He's out of a female family that we're all familiar with. It's the, uh, his dam is India, who uh, was a nice runner for, for Todd Pletcher. Um, the, dam, the female family is to honor and serve and pilfer and Angela Renee, uh, that family. So to try the dirt was not out of the question, they, they tried him over seven furlongs the last time, and, and he really just jumped out of the ground and ran a great race. And and really, on paper, he was the one to beat. And um, remarkably, for a son of Frankel, I think he's better on the dirt. Yeah, Lane's End graduate uh, from the, I guess, 2015 sale, September, and uh, he's got a big future. should also mention they had Keeper of the Stars, who's a two-time Keeneland sales graduate who won the Buena Vista over the weekend at Santa Anita and upset previously undefeated Jolie Olympica, who seemed like a real monster and, and still might be okay, but probably maybe a mile, a little bit too far for her. Um, so shout out to them, big 34 to one, long shot upset for Jonathan Wong. And they also had down on the bayou in the UAE Oaks, who uh, won over the weekend. Good. And, and credit Keeneland for tweaking the uh, the sale a little bit by adding the horses of racing age sale. I think that, that uh, you know, if you look at the horses of racing age sale throughout the calendar, um, um, it's gotten stronger and stronger. And I know we did an internal analysis and we're actually entering three or four horses in the sale, um, not because we don't think that they're good horses because they, they are, um, but rather because we're trying to maximize their value. So uh, tip of the cap to the Keeneland for adding a horses of racing age sale on the tail end of this two-year-old sale. That's good early in the year too, because the, the, the buyers can benefit longer throughout the campaign, whereas some of the later sales, some of the later horses of racing age sales, other ones are later in the year. Um, so another big race this weekend, Gulfstream has a huge card, uh, I think seven or eight stakes races, a couple, couple three-year-old races, 10 really. Ten. Um, so the big race, obviously the, the centerpiece of the day is the Facing Tipton Fountain of Youth stakes. Uh, like John said, this is, this is one of the big boy races as we get closer and closer, closer to the Derby. Just a little aside, it's interesting that the points, the qualifying points jump from 10 for the winner to 50 which I, to me that seems like a little bit of a big jump because I think the idea initially was to get people to run in more prep races, and now it's like why skip all the 10-point races just run in the 50-point race? Well, it's, it's the Bill Finley factor. You know, he's been poo-pooing all of these preps all the way through on the podcast. So, you know, that With I think— With you riding right along on my coattails. No question yeah. about it. I've always yeah. said that the races don't, don't really start— right. the big boy races don't start exactly. till now. Yeah. But, you know, but it's more fun to say the Bill Finley factor than it is the John Green factor because nobody cares about the John Green factor. So, <laughs> so we're just going to go with that. Brought to you by Rolls-Royce. All right, so before, thanks for that quick aside. Uh, 
the main the main contender, the big boy horse in the race is Dennis's moment. We're gonna to talk to Dennis Alba in a little bit. Obviously super impressive last year, Maiden Breaker, and then in the Iroquois went to his face at the start of the Breeders' Cup Juvenile and ran last. This will be his three year old debut. Shocking to me that they got twelve horses in this race. I thought they're gonna be like six or seven. I was really surprised when I was watching the draw and they had twelve slots there. The draw definitely was important this time. Dennis's mama got a good post. He's the two to one morning line favorite. He's in the five hole. But you look at the outside, Chancet, who is the seven to two second choice, is twelfth, is in a twelve hole. And Shotsky as well, who's a contender, is in a ten hole. Ete Indian is in the eleven hole. So Gulfstream especially, there's a very, very short run to that first turn. And I think in general, post eight and out, you were pretty much screwed. And it's going to be interesting, and I think it's going to create a faster pace than there might have been because I think these horses on the outside, especially Ete Indian, are going to need to gun it to get at least close to the lead so they don't lose too much ground. A little bit of a, of a bummer that Luca Panici hurt himself recently. He's the rider of Ete Indian as well as Sole Volante for Patrick Biancone. Looks like he's going to be out about a month or so. I always like it when these smaller jockeys who don't get these big mounts get the big three-year-olds on the Kentucky Derby Trail. So my hope is that he'll get the mount back when he's healthy. But, yeah, draw really affected the race, and I think all eyes will be on Dennis's moment. Dennis's moment, you would liked him going in, and now with this draw, you got to like him five times more and there's no and you, you touch on this joe there, there's no race configuration in the united states of america where post position are more important than these mile 16th mile and eighth races at golf stream you know you get a, a winner out of the 12 post once in five years type of thing uh, and you know it's, it's really not fair but when they decided to make it a mile and eighth racetrack there's nothing they could do about it uh you know horses like shotsky it take indian and chance it Three very good horses, three outside posts. They're going to have to run through their skin to uh, be able to win from those outside posts. And, you know, it's the type of thing where if they run a good fourth, where they're eight wide on, on the first turn and six wide on the second turn, well, that's not really going to do them any good because right now they all need points, that sort of thing. So, uh, you know, again, I wonder if we, if we might see in the next day or two some of these connections say, you know what, we're not going to do this. We're going to go to Tampa Bay for the, or something like that. I think you're going to see Chance get taken back from out there. I mean, he's obviously shown speed before, but what was encouraging about his run last time was that he was able to display a rating gear and then finish off his race. I think they're going to try to get him back a little bit and maybe get some cover and try not to sit a four-wide trip and, and maybe you know get into the two- or three-path, uh, trying to tuck in behind something, come out and make a run in the stretch. Really? Nothing to say, John? Because you don't have a horse in the race? You got well, nothing to I didn't, say? I didn't study the Fountain of Youth. Okay. Well, I'm, so, I'm here. It's wanna... the field. Yep. Um, it's a bunch of long shots, and then Dennis's and moment. Dennis's and Dennis's moment. Right, right. exactly. Yeah. exactly. Uh, but they also they also have the Devona Dale over the weekend. We don't have the PPs for that yet, but you would think Spice is nice. is going to be a major contender. The other thing I wanted to mention about the Fountain of Youth, though, is who's not in it. And that's Structor, who I think a lot of people, uh, Chad Brown had hinted that he was pointing towards that race, and now apparently he's had a minor setback. Uh, he was number three on our last TDN Derby top 12 from TD Thornton, and it just, I, don't know, I find it hard to believe that not making a start until now, a horse who's never been on the dirt before, I find it hard to believe he's going to be able to find his way into the Kentucky Derby starting gate. And it sucks because that was an interesting side story, I think, for for Chad Brown because he hasn't done this before with a turfy two-year-old trying to point them to the Derby. He's usually the horses that he has gotten there have started their career and run their entire career on the dirt. So it's unfortunate we're not going to get to see Structor in there. He's definitely a pretty good horse. But, uh, yeah, it's gonna probably going to be later in the year for him if he's going to have any dirt success. And Green Light Go as well. That's, That's right. Green Light Go is point. also out. Yeah, and he's, he's another one who I think uh, – it's. I think he might have peaked a little bit early, honestly. I think he he we, people gave him more credit, including me. People gave him more credit because he was so early for a trainer who does not start them early on. But I think he might have just been that outlier, and I, I find it tough to see him getting better from that two-year-old form. was not good in the soil. No, and, and do you think that there's a little bit of, of politics involved on this, being that the horse um, is owned by Stronach? And does he really want to run the horse at his home track and have it not run well, um, especially with all the turmoil going on and, and you know, the lawsuits and everything like that? Yeah. Um, so you wonder if, if it was a legitimate fever or if it was a fever that maybe he missed a couple of days and, and this is an excuse. Um, 
you know, you, you can make an argument either way. You can also say, Jesus, there's so many, you know, long shots in here that if Green Light Go was worthy of it and, and, and was healthy 100% that you'd think he would run in this race. Yeah, like I said, I was stunned to see 12 horses in here and have him instructor not be among the contestants. And now with the Devona Dale report, here's John Green. <laughs> I just have to say that I'm very happy for one person in history on this on this extra racing day, and that is Julius Caesar. Do you know why Julius Caesar is so important on this racing day? Something about the calendar, right? Is he born on a leap year or something? You know, you guys are almost both right, and yeah. so that means you're wrong. But, yeah, no, you're close. You're very close. Julius Caesar actually sat down and said, you know what? The, the, the seasons are always a day off every four or five years, so I, as Caesar, am going to add an extra day. And you know what, damn it? In 2020, that extra day ended up being the best racing day of the year. I wonder who Caesar is riding on in the <laughs> Fountain of Youth. Actually, it's a good point. I don't know if he can make weight. As seen on TV, maybe. As seen on TV, could be, could yeah. be. But, um, but as far as the, the female division of the, the important uh, uh, prep race, for the, in this case for the Kentucky Oaks, and that's the Devona Dale, um, we actually have a horse in there named Chart who's only going to be making her second career start. Um, she won impressively at Tampa Bay, and we were holding her out for this race, primarily because she won going seven-eighths. This is a mo- one-turn mile. Um, you know, she's training in Florida, so this is a natural to run in Florida. And, you know, it looked like there was going to be eight, nine, ten horses in the race, um, you know, ranging from Lake Avenue from the, the Mott trains um, all the way to Henning had a horse in there. We thought um, Baroness and Tonal of Shape was a local um, Safi Joseph horse. And, and, of course, Todd Pletcher. What would a, a Kentucky Oaks prep be without Todd Pletcher with Spice is Nice? And we were actually toying between – running chart in the Devona Dale or possibly in the Honeybee um, because the uh, the prep at, at Oaklawn, of course, was won by Taraz, who, who passed away, and that race only had four horses in it to begin with. So we went back and forth and actually decided to enter her into the Devona Dale, and we're going to take a look at it tonight and see how the race looks. Um, but a couple of the favorites did not enter. Ignoring the advice of unofficial DJ stable racing advisor Joe Bianca, he decided to stay in the Devoted Dale. We decided at least to enter, for right. sure. Cool. For sure. Well, we wish so, you luck. So a tip of the cap to you, because I'm always going to do the opposite of what you say anyway, <laughs> including <laughs> hairstyles. Um, and a tip of the cap to Julius Caesar from tens of thousands of years ago for adding this extra day of racing for all of us to be bountiful. I'll take that. Me and Caesar on the same in level. In the same level. Of course. Oh, exactly. Well, you really cared if it was March 1st with this day of racing, though. That, well, it's, it's more romantic. Other than, I know you have it's, a good story here. It's more like, romantic, don't and you? Th- that Ever comes up on Jeopardy, I will be able to answer well, that question. Well, now you will. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, yeah. exactly. The Who sa- invented leap year? The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With more than 500 clients in the horse business, they were bred to save you money. For more information on how they can help you, visit www.greenco.com. So for this week's Green Group Guest of the Week, we are thrilled to be joined by Dennis Alba of Alba Family Stables. Dennis, thank you so much for joining us. You bet. I'm... So you have the, you are in the enviable position of having not one but two early favorites for the Kentucky Derby uh, in Dennis's moment in Thousand Words. Dennis's moment runs this weekend, makes his three-year-old debut in the Fountain of Youth. I wanted to ask you about him, and he seems like he was a very precocious horse. When did you first know that you had something special in him? Well, you know, the first race wasn't so good because he threw the jockey off. Yeah. And then after that, we got him back. He healed up fine from that race. And then we went on and won the race by like 19 lengths. It was unbelievable. And then to go from that into the Uruguay and win that at Churchill, uh, we really thought we really had a horse and big excitement going out to the Breeders' Cup. And then that race didn't come out so good for us. Yeah, so he's he's had a little bit of bad luck. How do you how do you see him running on Saturday? You think he's cranked and ready to win? Yeah, well, I'm anxious to get him. He's been putting up some unbelievable workout times, and the trainer's done a great job, Dale Romans, with him. I'm bringing him back slowly. Uh, it's been the longest 87 days I think of my life <laughs> waiting between the Breeders' Cup and this coming race on Saturday, and a long time. But we need to deliver those high, those big time workouts to the track. So. This will be exciting, and it's a big field that we got uh, going into, and we're uh, um, got a bunch of my friends going over and excited to be at the race. Uh, Dennis, it's Bill Finley, and thanks for joining us. And something you've probably been asked a dozen or so times, maybe a hundred or so times already, but got to ask you, who is better, Thousand Words or Dennis's Moment? That's question number one. Question number two: If you were to win the Kentucky Derby, would you rather win it with one horse other than the other for any reason? 
You know, you know, that's a question I've been running over my mind and running over my mind a lot. And boy, they got different running styles. This um, Dennis's moment kind of gets out and goes hard, fast, early, and a uh, thousand words will doesn't come out of the gate real fast. But then he's got a stride that's unbelievable when he's uh, cranking it on, and just seems like he wants to go to the front. But you know, I'm actually. Uh, I, either one of them, <laughs> I would be very happy with to get. Um, I, I, we we haven't got two in yet, but we're getting closer. And if we can put up a good performance Saturday, we can uh, maybe get two of them in there. And we, uh, I, I couldn't be happier or, or stables right now at, that, at this point. Dennis, it's Jonathan Green from DJ Stable. First and foremost, uh, congratulations on this great run that you're having. A um, question for you is, you've been very active at the yearling sales, um, you know, buying horses as, as uh, you know, in the first, primarily the first and second book of the September sales at Keeneland. Um, what's the process that you go through in, in buying horses and ranking them? Because it's interesting, you've, you've purchased horses in a range from 20000 all the way up to a million dollars. So, so it, it, it's hard to see a pattern from an outsider. So give us, uh, you know, kind of a look behind the curtain as, as far as what the process is when you're picking yearlings out. You know, that's a, a good question. The, um, we got a team of seven people that basically we, before we bid on any horse, we've thoroughly run it. We vetted them, obviously, went through, and we went through the criteria with all the um, different uh, steps that we look at before we go in the arena and, and bid on them. And then we were able to pick up Dennis's moment up at the Flags and Tipton sale in Saratoga. And, and then we went on to the September sale and we bought uh, several others. But normally we try to find horses in the two to 400,000 range, but those are getting hard to find right now when, you, uh, when you're in that book one and book two. And every time we pick a nice one, we go, we go get our dauber down and put her head down. And finally, this uh, this Pioneer of the Nile, the thousand words came along, and he was one that we said, "Look, this is a stud. <laughs> this horse could be a stud, even if he doesn't run, because right. his breeding was excellent, and the looks of this horse is unbelievable." So we stretched a lot longer, and then we right after we bought it, I told my son-in-law, "Let's go." Go pick up a partner on this one because I, what that I left my price range that I was comfortable in on this one, and we were very happy to pick up a good partner on this one. Right. No, and, and that was actually going to be my follow-up question is with regard to picking partners, and, and you've had a couple of different partners on a couple of these horses. Are you looking to partner up with, with people who have – you know, stallion connections like you did with Spendthrift or, or is it, Hey, we wanted to, to have a horse, you know, give most of my horses to Dale Romans. I wanted to give a horse to, to Baffert. So I was giving him, you know, a chance to uh, have one of his clients buy into this, uh, this horse, a uh, thousand words. Right. It's not, I don't really, uh, with the stallion farms, you kind of, the future of the horse is probably right back to the original stallion farms they hook up to. So that's not our preferred route, but the Spencer people were there and they had also uh, obviously were looking at picking that horse up too, and they won them. And <laughs> so we did uh, hook up with them and the, uh, we partnered in with another horse on them and it was a great partnership. They're very good people and uh, we're very happy with them. Uh, so, uh, but normally we like to just go alone on them on the horses. Hey, Mr. Alba, it's Alan Carrasso. Uh, thanks for being with us. I want to uh, take you back to the beginnings and uh, talk a little bit about Miss Macy Sue. Um, uh, curiously enough, uh, you're an Iowa person, and it could be a big year for Iowa on the Triple Crown Trail with with your presence as well as Maggie Moss. Um, if uh, no parole is able to jump through those hoops. Um, but take us through the journey with Miss Macy Sue. She started, obviously, made a name for herself at Prairie Meadows, um, took you to the Breeders' Cup here at Monmouth Park on uh, that wonderfully wet weekend uh, in uh, October 2007. But, uh, you know, just to take us through the ride with her as a racehorse and what she's gone yeah. on to do as a broodmare. Yeah, that, that Miss Macy Sue, I named it after one of my granddaughters, and I don't know if that was the right decision because well, I guess it probably was because it didn't. there was no way I was going to go to my, one of my granddaughters and said, oh, I sold your horse. So anyway, we kept that horse, and uh, it, 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 it kind of spoiled me being in the horse business when you run Miss Macy Sue because we took it out to many races, and it just kept winning. 
all the time. And boy, I thought we can't go wrong here. <laughs> so I got very carried away after that point. And that's the horse that got me into the horse business. And, uh, and then today it keeps kicking off a good, uh, a baby every year. Um, and it's up to like a 15 year old horse, I believe now. And, uh, hopefully we got several more out of it. And, uh, when you get, when you don't, those type of horses don't come along very often. And uh, we bought a lot of other mares and trying to breed them up and get them. We haven't got anywhere close to what Miss Macy Sue and her baby Taylor S puts out. And uh, not too many people have bred two TD and Rising Stars, not to pat ourselves on the back. <laughs> the most important metric. Well, of course. But right, um, right. Miss Macy Sue is obviously the dam of, uh, of Liam's map, who you sold nicely at auction. And uh, Taylor S, who you just mentioned, was also a, a TD and Rising Star that you raced and as a homebred. And additionally, uh, Miss Macy Sue is, is the dam of a current three-year-old called Matera uh, by Tapu. I think broke its maiden last year going long first time, if, if memory serves. Right, right. Yeah, uh, uh, we, I'd like to take some money off the table. So once in a while, we uh, mainly we don't keep fillies uh, in our portfolio. We're mainly trying to – our mission is to try to win the Kentucky Derby. And um, – we so we obviously tried to get Colts, so we sold off of Philly off of Miss Macy Sue. And we got we after we sold that one for I think it was a million four, right? Million, that's probably why I got right million four to Don Alberto Corp and, and the Philly should beat Kingham came back to be a uh, great two place last time. So uh, maybe another uh, all Bob Red has a nice future. That's true, that's true. Well, we're hoping for that. Hey, Dennis, uh, we know where Dennis's moment is going to go, Fountain of Youth, then Florida, probably Florida Derby, then, of course, Kentucky Derby, if everything goes well. But we haven't heard from Bob Baffert or anybody from your team about the plans for 1,000 words, what his schedule is going to be between now and the Kentucky Derby. So uh, cl- uh, fill us in, please. You know, we're looking hard at that San Pepe race. That's, uh, I think, March 7th. And, or at least I got a ticket out, I head out there on March 6th. Uh, but anyway, uh, we're looking hard at that race, but we haven't made that. Uh, Bob hasn't said, yes, we're going to do that one for sure. But he has told us the horse couldn't be training better. So it's all the, everything's coming up. Uh, and the nice thing about uh, taking these races uh, like we are at Gulf Spring and running right in our home park and then out at uh, Santa uh, Anania and right there in our home park and not having to put them on a plane and haul them across town, get them in an uncomfortable setting. It seemed to work real well when you just leave them out of their stables and put them on the track. So that, that's the plans is to try to stay home with both of uh, Dennis's moment and thousand words. Dennis, I wanted to ask you about a horse who isn't in a stake, but maybe if he's good enough, we'll have one in his future, who is actually debuting tomorrow at Gulfstream in the fourth race, a horse named Coastal Defense, who was an $800,000 Keeneland September yearling. He's a half to Hawk Bill, who was a multiple grade one winner on the turf. Also half to Free Drop Billy, who you're very familiar with. What can you tell me about him? Well, it's because of Free Drop Billy. We bought that horse uh, <laughs> because the, the, the brother was very good, and he's on in the stallion farm right now. But anyway, uh, that was the reason we stretched out and got that one. And hopefully we'll see some uh, good results out of that horse tomorrow. So he hasn't stepped up to the plate like the other couple have, but uh, hopefully it's, that's yet to come. He's been, work- he's been working bullets at Gulfstream. What has Dale told you about him? He said that everything's uh, – he says you got you one heck of a horse there. Hmm. Uh, so anyway, Dale's, Dale's very high on him also. So we're, we're in hopes that uh, we can get him in a – race uh, a point race here all right dennis that's all we got for you thanks so much for the time and, and best of luck right, this weekend we're, we're excited nice to see him to run guys. too good luck okay Thank nice you. talking thanks, to you dennis. guys bye right. thanks Bob. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With more than 500 clients in the horse business, they were bred to save you money. For more information on how they can help you, visit www.greenco.com. So after having just wrapped up with uh, Dennis Alba, we're going to talk to a much smaller owner right now and put him on the hot seat, John Green of DJ Stable, because he had an interesting horse win over the weekend um, for John Service. This is a, I wanted to bring this up, and I think it's a little bit of an instructive case potentially because we've talked in the past on this podcast about how you're kind of blind as a better when horses disappear onto the sidelines and then reappear for a tag or not. There's an interesting horse that he had named Blue. He has named Blue Buff, who a couple years ago at Gulfstream in February of 2017 was really well bet. Was six to five first time out and won by three lengths for Joe Orsino and was named a TDN Rising Star. He's a son of Unbridled Song. Then he went on the shelf for 
over two years and return for a trainer that I've never heard of named TM Roberts was eighth in a Gulfstream Park West allowance on turf, then was second in a $35,000 claimer on the Gulfstream Park West dirt, returned to John service and was 11th in a turf race, a starter allowance turf race at Gulfstream, then was dropped in for 12-5 and won, and then won a starter optional claimer over the weekend and got a really nice figure, got an 89 buyer, was really impressive, looked good. So I want to know the story of this horse, John, and how he took all these turns. Well, let me let me spin you back to 2015 um, when we were at the Keeneland September sale looking for a really nicely bred colt. And we happened upon this unbridled song colt who was flashy gray, steel gray, which which is my my weakness. I love gray horses. Um, and it was from unbridled songs last crop. And we went ahead, and at the time, that was the most expensive horse we'd ever purchase. Um, and we stretched. 400? 400,000, mm-hmm. and we stretched. And at the time, you know, Joe Racino, who was training for us at the time, picked, helped pick him out. Um, the horse was uh, sent over to Hiddenbrook Farm, which, is, which ties in Mark Roberts as a trainer, because Mark, um, you know, manages that, uh, that organization um, and breaks all of our yearlings. And the horse was doing great. We decided in 2000, beginning of 2017, actually to part ways with Joe. And at the time, um, because Joe had, is a good friend of mine and also had, had done such a great service to us over the years, his last request for us was, can I please run this horse once at Gulfstream? And I'll send all the other horses over to John Service, um, but I really want to have this horse for, for four more weeks just so I can make sure I can, I can run, uh, run this horse because I picked him out. I've been there every step of the way with him. And sure enough, the horse, you know, fulfilled the destiny and, and won very, very easily. Um, about a week later, he came up with a little tendon issue. Um, so John Service did the right thing and sent him back to Mark Roberts, and we gave him almost an entire year off just to heal that tendon um, tear. And the concern with the tendon, not to go too far into the weeds, but the concern with the tendon is you want to make sure that the elasticity comes back because it's not like a bone where you break a bone, you put some screws in and in there, um, you harden it up, and the horse is okay to go again. Tendons, um, like all of us as we're getting older with our muscles, they, they need to stretch, need to have elasticity, and, and that you lose that over time. So the horse bowed his tendon, um, and we gave him a year off. Mark was very patient with him and got him back to the track. He got up to three-eighths of a mile on the, on the breeze, about ready to go back up north to, to John's service. Again, this is a year later, and he bows the other tendon. And at that point, you know, as a manager, I said, we're done. We're going to have to just donate him um, or give him to a good home because we've given him over a year, and he's not going to come back off a double bow. Um, to my father's credit and to Mark Roberts' credit, they said, no, we love the horse so much. We're so enamored with him that we're going to give him an entire year off again. And basically for that next year, all he did was he was in a stall. He did some acupuncture to reduce the swelling. Um, He went out into a field with two other geldings, and they just bucked and played when he finally got to that level. And then every day, once the horse was sound enough, Mark Roberts brought him to the track and held his breath as he went around that, uh, the, his track every day. And Mark gave him almost another year of R&R and training before he brought him back. Follow-up question. So he did come back and didn't run well first time out. What were you thinking when you dropped him in for 12-5? Well, we, we knew that it would take a couple of, of races for him to get his swagger back because, like all of us as we're getting older, um, if, you don't, if you don't play, if you play golf and then you give yourself off a year, the first couple of rounds you play, you're not going to play very well. You have to get back literally into the swing of it. And we knew going into it with, with two bow tendons that um, the horse was going to need to have a couple of races to, to, uh, to get back into the swing of it. We tried the turf because we thought the turf would be a softer – um, you know, softer on, on his bones because now he was five turning six. And uh, he ran okay. Then we ran for 35. He ran second. Um, and then we ran him back after, you know, Mark said, okay, I know he's sound. Let's give him the John service. And he just didn't run well on the turf course at, uh, at Gulfstream Park. So at that point in time, we sat down and said, nobody in their right mind is going to claim this horse, even though five horses every claiming race you know, basically get, get claimed at, at Gulfstream. There's no way in hell that anyone's going to claim this horse after this kind of a story, knowing that he's got two bow tendons and, and, and the like. Um, so we got very aggressive, and we put him in for 12-5, um, for the never went to for 12-5. And just in a matter of a little bit of gamesmanship, we put a, uh, a, um, an, a, uh, excuse me, a, a bug boy 
on them. Christian Torres. Christian Torres. And what we did was we made sure the Torres came out uh, the week before to gallop them, just to show them that the horse was sound. Um, but that we were kind of taking an edge and running them in for the 12-5. Um, and we got away with it, and now he's eligible for every single starter race, basically. And we think that this horse is going to be our claiming crown horse in December. He's also got this, all of his allowance conditions, too. He's got all of his allowance conditions. And actually, with that last win, he actually ran a, a good enough buyer um, where he can be legitimately in, in some of these older stake races as well. Um, so, you know, the world's his oyster now. Uh, you know, at the, at the tender age of six um right. he, you know he's he's fulfilling his promise and uh, and now he's got an easier you know pattern an easier path i should say to go with some of these races coming up all his allowance conditions starter allowances for the next two years um and you know at the end of march new york has a starter day claiming crown is the end of december um i remember you know monmouth used to have the maloof starter handicap uh series and i don't know if they're doing it again for 2020 but there's tracks now that are really looking at these starter races um as a really attractive way to have some of these old claimers come in and kind of battle it out for a little bit more money uh, without the risk of, of losing the horse in, in the claiming box yeah and that's a great story and we appreciate you sharing all that with us so I, like i said i thought it'd be instructive in terms of seeing some of the behind the scenes of why horses go on the bench and why they get dropped down. Uh, but I think it's also a good story of perseverance, too, and that a lot of times one of the things we decry on this show is horses that are completely given up on and sent to Mountaineer Park to run for 5K claimers, and then who knows where they end up after that. So, you know, it, it takes patience, it takes resources, but a lot of times these horses will still have something in them if you do the right things by them. And, and again, I want to reiterate that I give a lot of credit to the patients that, you know, my dad has, that Mark Roberts had, because he was with the horse literally every single day, um, and John Service. They all did an outstanding job of, of basically, you know, nursing this horse back to health. And every day was a decision of, should we continue on or should we not? Um, and again, to Mark's credit, he always knew that if the horse wasn't going to make it as a racehorse, we were donating back to him to become um, his personal pony, mm -hmm. um, you know, on, on the racetrack there. So he was going to live a good life either way. Right. Um, I will tell you this, there are some horses that, that we've all seen that love to train, and there's some horses that love to compete. And that this horse has those tendencies. Mm -hmm. He absolutely loves to train. He loves being out there every day. And that was a big part of it too, was, you know, when, he, does he, does he have the want to, does yeah. he want to continue to train and, and race and compete? Um, and he loves it. He came back, you know, from, from the race, uh, you know, was in the winter circle and was basically like, you know, pawing at everybody like, come on, I want to do this again. I need to do more. Um, so hopefully we haven't hit the bottom of the tank with him yet. Yeah. I mean, with still only six starts, you, you, you think he's, as long as he stays healthy, knock on wood, that he'll, he'll have a lot more starts left in. Um, so we we appreciate you sharing and I was watching the races on Saturday and I was like that's a pretty good looking horse and then I was like why do I remember that name and I remembered it was a TDN rising star that disappeared well that's why we really brought him back because I didn't want you guys right. to look bad you know yeah. that, that's what it was you know and I would say that this horse is the Alan Carrasso of, of race horses also but I've used that once before <laughs> the, buff, so. the, the buff part the buff, part, the the buff and the gray right. yeah exactly <laughs> exactly <laughs> The TDN Riders Room is sponsored by West Point Thoroughbreds. Owning a multiple graded stakes winning racehorse like Hard Not to Love is attainable with a racing partnership like West Point Thoroughbreds. Partnerships enable you to spread your ownership across several horses for less than it costs to own one horse alone. This increases your racetrack action and chances for a big horse. Check out why West Point Thoroughbreds is the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit their website, westpointtb.com. So, this week, uh, it's hard to top, hard not to love from the previous week, but West Point had some good results. They had a couple winners on Saturday at uh, Aqueduct, horse named Debord that broke his maiden by 11 and a half lengths. Also, a horse named Septimia Severus. In Louisiana, they had a hard knocking mare named Room to Finish who won. But one of the horses that they had run over the weekend that I think is the most interesting out of all of them is a horse who ran second and is still a maiden. It's a horse named Divine Armor, who's a $250,000 OBS March purchase by Include. And he ran second by a neck in a Santa Anita maiden and got an 89 buyer. And he's kind of ascended through throughout his four career starts thus far. And even though he's a maiden, 89 buyer at this point in the season... I'd say that bodes pretty well for a horse that could t develop into a stakes horse. And we saw that last year. I'm not comparing the two, but we saw that last year with Omaha Beach, who took a while to break his maiden, but he was clearly getting better. And then he had these big figure races, finally broke through, and then got on a little bit of a roll there. So we wish West Point the best of luck 
with him, and we'll be on the lookout for him going forward. They have another interesting horse worth uh, mentioning as well when you talk about three-year-olds perhaps getting to the Derby. This horse, Chestertown, they paid a cool $2 million for, was second in an allowance race at Fairgrounds uh, a couple weeks back. And if you check the West Point website, they put down where the horses are going to run in their next start, and they are listing him as a, a Louisiana Derby horse. So uh, he uh, hasn't lived up to the $2 million price tag yet, but he looks, again, like he's getting better, just like the horse you talked about, Joe, is by Tappet. And if he can parlay that nice uh, performance in a fairgrounds allowance into a good performance in the Louisiana Derby, he'll likely be Kentucky Derby bound as well. Hmm. Yep, Tappas, Artemis Agriterra, and I'm sure you watched the race. It was nine furlongs on the Risen Star undercard. Um, he got in as much trouble as you could possibly get in and uh, and still made it close. And he should appreciate the, uh, the uh, nine and a half furlongs of the Louisiana Derby. Joining a West Point Thoroughbreds partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie, kind of like the instant camaraderie that we have here. <laughs> Among people surrounding high-class horses and stakes action for a fraction of the cost of trying to do it on your own, learn more at westpointtb.com. So before we head out of here, uh, we'd be remiss not to mention the great AP Indy who passed away last week at the uh, really ripe old age of 31, lived, lived a good long life, and Obviously, he was a terrific racehorse, but I think his his legacy, even more so, is the sire line that he created. And I kind of compare him, if you're a football fan, I kind of compare him to Bill Walsh. Bill Walsh was an old coach for the San Francisco 49ers, and he was famous for having this great coaching tree where all these coaches that were assistant coaches for him and coordinators went on to become great coaches in their own right. Uh, Bill Belichick has not quite had the same success. I had to get that dig in. Um, <laughs> screw the Patriots. But no, so I, I think AP and D, he's, well, we'll just, I'm going to just read off a quick list of horses that he sired who went on to become good sires of their own. You got Pulpit, Mineshaft, Jumpstart, Congrats, Bernardini, Take Charge Indy, Malibu Moon, Flatter. Uh, he was also a really good broodmare sire. He was a broodmare sire to Royal Delta, Super Saver, Plum Pretty, Wait a While, Bluegrass Cat, any given Saturday. And to my Bill Walsh analogy, he's a sire of sires as well, and Pulpit is the the prime example of that, having sired Tappet, who now is having his own sire line as well. He was also, Pulpit was also sire of Lucky Pulpit, obviously, who produced California Chrome, and then you got Sky Mesa under the Pulpit tree as well. And just before I let you guys talk, I wanted to mention that the, the latest two from his last crop, who I think are going to carry the flag going forward, most importantly, Honor Code, who I think has been off to a pretty good start. And Commissioner is also from his last crop, and, and he looks like a decent sire going forward as well. What I'll remember him for was the great race in, in 1992 when he was clearly the best three-year-old in the country. And, you know, during that 37-year drought where we didn't have a Triple Crown winner, you look at so many horses and say, you know, what could have been? You know, Risen Star comes to mind if he gets a better trip in the Kentucky Derby, et cetera. You know, there's a dozen or so you could say that with a little bit of luck they would have won the Triple Crown. Uh, this was the um, the same story as Omaha Beach. Essentially, he was the morning line favorite for the Kentucky Derby and was uh, announced that morning that he was scratched with a foot bruise. And then uh, Neil Drysdale brought him back in the Peter Pan, then the Belmont, and then, uh, of course, a couple of starts later, he won the Breeders' Cup Classic. But, you know, it's all hypothetical, but it's fun to think about these things. Had he not had that foot bruise, would he have won the Kentucky Derby? Would he possibly have been a Triple Crown uh, horse? Uh, you know, that's a big if, but, you know, when he was that much better than his peers in that three-year-old crop, and I think he was, you know, it's, it's safe to, uh, it's fair to say that maybe we lost a triple crown winner because of that. I think it's also safe to say that he was once in a generational kind of horse. Um, and, and look, he, he was breeding royalty. Uh, you know, anytime you get Seattle Slough out of Weekend Surprise, um, you know, that that's where you start the argument or start the discussion. Um, and then he had the looks. He actually went to the yearling sale. Then it was the Keeneland July sale. So he's a Keeneland grad. Um, and he sold for $2.9 million, which back in 1999, 1990, excuse me, $2.9 that is the equivalent of like, what, $1.8 billion? Now? Is that <laughs> I, it, actually, the equivalent's like five point seven. You're giving hey, me the hand. You're the, you're the Math is guy. not John Strong. Yeah, it, it's five point seven. It's a lot of money. Five point seven million dollars in today's um, today's numbers. So, you know, he had the looks and he had the pedigree. Um, Joe, you mentioned some of the sires that and 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 you know that that he begot over the years. He has currently twenty nine sons standing at stud across the country. 29. I mean, that's incredible. Um, and the other thing statistically that really impressed me with him was that 
he has 88 graded stake winners and 12 champions. And you say that's that's pretty good compared to even some of the current sires like Quality Road and Into Mischief and some of the you know, Stormcat, some of the top sires of, of our generation. But, you know, his average full crop was 68 horses a year. So he had like almost a third of less horses than some of the top sires have right now. And yet he eclipsed them in graded stake wins and overall champions. Um, and then just to finish out, he, his his horses were so sought after that 49 of his yearlings sold for over a million dollars. I mean, that those those numbers alone show you not only was he, you know, the greatest of his generation physically and pedigree wise, but his foals were that much, you know, that extraordinary as well. And every year he had one or two top horses because as we've seen in, in this difficult cycle um, of stallions, if you don't produce year to year, you get forgotten about. Um, so he, he, to me, you know, really was once in a generation. Um, it was at a time when we were first getting really involved in the horse industry in the, in the mid nineties. And um, he had such an impact on me. Like I said, at, at the open, we actually named um, my chocolate lab um, Indy after him because it was, it was just such an impactful uh, horse in the industry. She was also, a Kentucky bread, by the way. Um, but, you know, I would love to see in my lifetime another horse like this. Mm-hmm. I hope that we're going to see another sire of sires like this that also not only had the pedigree, but also had the race record to back it up. I'm going to dovetail on your um, sires sort of thread there, John. I mean, for what it's worth, the AP Indy influence extends to places like Korea, where he's got a couple of sire sons. Peru, he's got a former Jonathan Shepard trainee called just as well, who's in South Africa. There's a, a AP Indy half-brother, King Mambu, stands in South Africa, or stood. And um, even Saudi Arabia, the former um, JMS horse called Worldly, is, uh, is a stallion there. Probably see some of his progeny in the entries this weekend. But um, it's kind of fun to, to think back. AP Indy predated my thoroughbred fandom, um, so I wasn't really paying attention when he was running around, but I did have a bet on Tempera in the 2001 <laughs> Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies. And um, like to think that was his first champion is um, just sort of mind-boggling. So, you know, great sire, you know, great legacy as a sire and as a broodmare sire. And what, to, to piggyback off that, one of my best memories from him is when I was first starting to get into the game, Bernardini was one of my favorite horses, and I, I went to the back stretch. Saratoga in 2006 and got to meet him and um, pet him and, and see him in his in, in, in the full flesh and he was an incredible racehorse and and I didn't really grasp at the time how big it was that he was a son of AP Indy and then as I learned more about racing and about breeding I was like wow this this horse not only has incredible talent but has incredible bloodlines and is carrying on these bloodlines to pass on for generations and I think I, I agree with John that it it's a rare thing to see this kind of horse who has such an impact over decades and I, you hope we, that we get to see another horse like that I think Tappet has a decent chance to be like that but there are, there are precious few who are able to have that kind of a wide-reaching impact in this sport and to this day he still owns the or holds the second fastest Belmont behind Secretariat Mm-hmm. And you know how many hundred and what is it, Bill? Hundred and a lot, a hundred and a lot yeah. um, Belmonts, <laughs> and he is the second fastest. And he did it with literally half a hoof. Yeah, he was playing hurt. Yeah, so it was uh, obviously an incredible performance, incredible life for AP Indy. One more thing I wanted to mention: I this will be my lasting image of AP Indy. As Lane's End posted something on Twitter a while ago that went semi-viral in the racing world, and it was uh, stallion. It, the people were coming to see the stallions, and it was him. Mineshaft and Honor Code, and Mineshaft and Honor Code were kind of acting up a little bit, and AP and D just shoots them a look, and they both stop. <laughs> and they both are on their best behavior. So I think that, I thought that was a really cool representation of what a boss he was and, and the kind of authority, I think, that he had in racing. All right, so that's going to do it for this episode of the TDN Writers Room presented by Keeneland, the home of world-class racing and industry-leading sales. Keeneland's next auction is the April Two-Year-Olds in Training and Horses of Racing Age sale on Tuesday, April 7th. Nomination deadline for Horses of Racing Age is this Monday, March 2nd. I want to thank Bill Finley, John Green, Alan Carrasso, the Green Group guest of the week, Dennis Albaugh, our producer, Patty Wolf, and our editor, Nathan Wilkinson. We will talk to you next week.